world. So uh, it's uh, been really awesome in bringing something new as a cross training tool, but also um, bringing a lot of people a new fun way to enjoy a healthy lifestyle and enjoy their backyard differently from, you know, going on a run or um, going to the gym. Although I do work at a gym too. I'm a personal trainer as well. Um, so the reason we wanted to, to bring Jen on um, today, you know, on these sessions, we tend to have a lot of endurance athletes and, and as well, we'll find out here over the next uh, few minutes, um, Jen's sport is very much an endurance sport. And um, Jen was um, previously in her previous fueling strategy, she was uh, what many people now refer to as a sugar burner, uh, relying on a lot of fast acting carbohydrates, a lot of sugars to fuel her training. And Jen made the switch to UCAN um, about, uh, what was it, Jen? Was it about six, seven months ago now? Or has it even been that long? No, it's been actually – little over a year. A little over say, a year. Yeah. I, I made the switch, I think, in, let's see, January of 2012. Um, before that, I was actually one of Goo's athletes. <laughs> How about that? So you've got a good, uh, you've got a good perspective on uh, both sides of the spectrum. Uh, with, uh, that'll, that'll be, it'll be very interesting to hear your insight. And before we get started, just a, a couple uh, housekeeping matters. Um, to make these sessions uh, productive, you know, I like to get a sense out of uh, who we have in our audience today and, uh, you know, how, how familiar you folks are with the product and how often you guys have used it too. So I, I will just do a couple quick poll questions to get us started. And that way we can sort of tailor this thing on the fly and make sure that we talk about uh, what the folks in attendance are interested in hearing about when it comes to, to you can and just overall strategies to feel yourself. But uh, the other thing too is at any point, if you want to ask a question, feel free to shoot us a note in the in the questions tab. Um, we'll be answering questions throughout the whole way. So we definitely will make sure to get to everybody's questions and um, and we'll even bring some of you folks on if people want to share their experiences or, or you know, some people want to just chat with us in person. Um, if you have a mic on your computer, then you can talk directly into that microphone. Um, I'll unmute you and um, and we can all chat. So really the uh, the idea of this is to be as interactive as possible. We want to make sure that you all are getting um, uh, what you want out of this session. So just as a poll question uh, to start out with, um, interested in hearing what everybody um, either does use UCAN for or is interested in using UCAN for if you haven't used it. So um, if you want to go ahead and answer the poll on the screen, we'll give about 10, 15 seconds for everyone to do so. Um, and in the meantime, Jen, um, give us a little bit of, of your athletic background. Uh, before you were uh, involved in stand-up paddle racing and, and stand-up paddle surfing, what other types of sports were you participating in? Um, well, I grew up doing equestrian sports, actually, and then also ski racing. And uh, that was my, my entire life till about college. And then um, ski racing, I was really into like Super G that was my real event. And I made it to about the fist development level and then uh, decided to focus on college. Through college, I did some triathlons actually to try and lose weight, which now that I'm a trainer, I know um, triathlon is a wonderful sport. But when you're training for a triathlon, it, it's not always the best time for weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then once I moved out to Hawaii, I started, I started surfing in California, but, uh, really started surfing once I moved out here and did surf contests. I still do, um, just pure surfing longboard contests. Um, and then once the stand up thing started going, I, I tried it and I just totally fell in love with it. It carries so much of my skiing background into, uh, into the sport, it it just made for a really good combination. So you said something uh, very fascinating in there, which which we're going to talk about a lot today. Um, but but you were talking about triathlon when you're training for a triathlon, like you did in the past, not always being the best time uh, to lose weight. And and I think a lot of endurance athletes training for uh, a difficult race, uh, they find that 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 they they're putting in a lot of work, putting in a lot of training, and may necessarily not be seeing the body composition results that, or, or the weight loss results that they desire, even though, you know, they're training at a very high clip. Um, and, and there's a lot of factors uh, which we'll explore 
a little bit more. And I think you have you have an interesting personal um, experience to, to, to on, on that subject. Um, but just um, I think for some folks are will probably be curious. Give us a description of what stand up paddle surfing is. Uh, you know, what's what are you doing? What's the position that you're in on the board? All that. So, uh, so when you're stand up paddling, you're uh, there so many different disciplines so the technique varies slightly but in general you're um, standing on a gigantic surfboard or um, or almost like a flat kayak in a way depending on what type of board you're riding the surfboards are smaller um, and they look like surfboards that are big enough to stand on all the time um, the race boards are more shaped like a, a cross between a canoe like a um the the part you sit on of a one-man canoe or a kayak and then um it's a cross between that and i'd say a prone paddleboard and so uh there are quite a few variations but you're standing on the board and you have a pretty much an elongated canoe paddle in your hand and uh you use that to propel yourself forward um there is such a new sport. There's so much R and D and innovation going on that there's a lot of variations in equipment, but, but in general, that's, that's what it is. And the disciplines kind of go, um, you have flat water where you're paddling on lakes and, uh, flat water rivers. Um, and then you have the downwind paddling, which there's actually open ocean swells that you're riding or like on the, on the gorge up in Oregon, there's swells from the wind. And then, uh, and then you have surfing, which is you're surfing on a stand up board. But the difference between that and normal surfing is that you're on your feet most, if not all of the time, which changes the dynamic quite a bit because you have to drop in on your feet. You have to catch the wave on your feet without falling and all that kind of good stuff. And then also they have the surf race, which, is really exciting to watch and i think it has a tremendous potential as a spectator sport because everybody you know puts on helmets and gets on these big giant boards and paddles out through surf and there's a lot of collisions and a lot of kind of luck involved where you're catching the wave and you may not be faster than the person in front of you but if you know how to time it so that you're catching a wave on the way in you can pass them um and then there are all kinds of fantastic collisions and stuff which make it really neat as a as a spectator sport absolutely everybody everybody loves to, the collisions uh, as a spectator <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Jen as you you see and as everyone sees on the screen we have a lot of endurance athletes um, in here like we like we generally do and um, we also have a, a fair number of people who are interested in using UCAN for weight loss um, so you know, I, one of the big uh, reasons that I thought it'd be great to have you on here too is because, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but stand up paddle surfing is very much an endurance sport, isn't it? I mean, how, how long are you out there? Um, a lot of yeah. times you're out there. Yeah. Most of the, um, most of the races are an endurance race. So it, it could go anywhere from one mile to uh, 32 miles to there's a, actually a multi-day race in, one of the Scandinavian countries that goes like 20 miles a day for four or five days, which 20, 20 miles on flat water will take you quite a number of hours, like basically like doing an Ironman race. Um, so, so it really is an endurance sport and people haven't really specialized yet. So as an athlete, you have to be ready to sprint a mile, which is, you know, a 10 to 20 minute race. And then, um, also be ready to go 32 miles across an open ocean channel um, where there's rough water and a lot of challenges. So it's, it's definitely a sport that tests your endurance. You also run a higher heart rate uh, generally than um, triathlon or marathon, which is something fascinating that I'm, I'm learning about. Um, but yeah, so very much an endurance sport. So with with any endurance sport, and, and you talked about the, the length of the activity and, and comparing it to, to, you know, an Ironman triathlon or even an, an ultra run in, in some cases when you have those really long distances, you know, nutrition becomes paramount. It's, it's, it's as important as the training you put in. It's as important as, 
as you know any other aspect of the race really if you're, if you're going to be out there um for so long so you know initially what were you doing to fuel yourself um for these races and and i guess you know when did you how did you realize that you needed to change the way you were feeling yourself yeah um my first super long paddle was a uh... A few days before the Catalina Challenge, I decided I was going to paddle 40 miles solo from Catalina Island to Dana Point. And uh, I was using goo. Um, and that's what I'd been using on my training runs. And that's what I was using out there. And I did not realize that after mile 20, um, I was going to start dry heaving. <laughs> and that was awful. Um, I ended up switching to the only other thing I had on me was animal crackers. <laughs> um, and there are pictures of me online somewhere eating animal crackers while crossing that channel. Um, and then the, the following race that was a big, really long race was um, Molokai to Oahu. And I couldn't even use goo because it was so hard to pass it between the boat. And I, I, wasn't expecting that they ended up throwing me peanut butter and jelly sandwich frisbees that were landing in salt water and my whole boat was seasick so I was again trying not to throw up the entire way and um I decided to get tested I kind of thought something might be a little different about me just because um I was still I still had a belly and I was doing all these long endurance events and my calorie intake wasn't particularly high I wasn't eating any food that was particularly bad for you. I was following all the recommendations that, you know, um, the old school of thinking about carbohydrates, um, you know, with, with that whole mode of thinking, I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything different from that, but I still had this belly and none of my competition did. That was irritating. And, um, so I went to UC Davis and I got, um, I got tested, so they did a metabolic profile and uh, at their sports testing facility, which is fantastic. And, um, and everything was pretty normal. My body fat was a little high for the type of athlete that I was, but uh, the major thing was I never had a crossover point. So there was no point in that test where I ever metabolized primarily fat as fuel. And that was when they pointed me towards fuel formants and I started working with Dina over there on my nutrition. And that was also when Dina pointed me towards UCAN. And we started using UCAN. Um, you guys gave me a bunch of samples, I remember. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and I started using it in my long training sessions and I was finding I could go a lot longer, especially using that with um, a metabolically efficient nutrition program where I was, you know, promoting stable blood sugar throughout the day through what I was eating. Um, but using the UCAN, um, I could eat less and go for longer. Uh, my body composition, not just um, the amount of fat in my body, but where I was storing it changed, which I thought was fascinating. I went to storing it around my midsection to being a little bit more pear shaped. Um, which had never, ever happened for me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I could go for a long time. I never had stomach upset. Um, it was just absolutely awesome. Um, also, I didn't ever have to worry about my food, which was so cool. Because before, I was always, like, trying to think of what wouldn't gross me out, you know, five or six hours in, you know, we did two days of like 12 hour paddles, you know, two days in a row. And I never once had any stomach upset, which was incredible. So yeah, that's how I started using UCAN. And then in training, it helps with recovery so much. Um, yeah, it's just such a great product. So you, you raised a, a, a bunch of interesting um, things, Jen, and, and, you know, there's maybe a lot of people in here that are familiar with some of what you were saying, but, but I want to, you know, get into it a little bit further. And, and Seth, um, when Jen was talking about uh, the idea of, you know, utilizing or, or not being a fat burner when she was getting tested and being a sugar burner, um, 
let's let's take a, a few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, the different fuels your body can use and and what what's what the advantages are yeah. and what they aren't. So what what we're, what we're looking at here is um, this is a blood sugar curve, and uh, this basically shows what happens um, in your body when you consume a fast acting carbohydrate. Now, Seth, what are some examples, um, you know, of fast acting carbohydrates that people would consume in the context of exercise? Well, you know, things like gels, goos, um, any sugar-based sports drink, a lot of the, you know, the Red Bulls, caffeine sugar drinks, um, any, any energy bar that's high in sugar. And what's what's happening? Uh, you know, maybe you can walk us through this graph and and what's happening when you know, like Jen was talking about, when you're relying on that to fuel your body. And Jen was talking about some stomach issues. She was talking about having uh, a belly, uh, and and I think we we see all that in this slide. But maybe you can just talk us through it. So, but you know, this is this is the problem with fueling today is that you know the things we're choosing, like the the goos, the the quick acting energy bars sugar-based sports drinks or, you know, even, you know, I remember, Varun, you were telling me before a, mar uh, before a 15 mile run, you saw someone have three bananas. So <laughs> that was a couple weekends ago. Yeah. I mean, that's 75 grams of carbohydrate before, uh, you know, before a 15 mile run. And what's happening is all the calories and sugars rush the bloodstream very quickly and you spike your blood sugar. And then what someone's really experiencing um, during their exercise, they're experiencing their blood sugar decline. And that's what's causing that 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 energy crash. So, if you look at this graph, you see the red line. When it goes up, that's upon intake of a fast-acting carbohydrate. Oftentimes, you'll experience that blood sugar crash thirty to forty-five minutes after consuming it. Sometimes even sooner, depending on the dose and and you know the individual. And when that your blood sugar starts to drop, um, that's when you start to feel fatigue. That's when you start to you could start to feel hungry, um, and the critical point that Seth talked about and that Jen was telling us about too, um, you know, that she was seeing anecdotally is when you're relying on those fast acting carbohydrates um, to fuel you, you're really blocking your ability to burn fat because your 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 body's utilizing all that that excess uh, the excess sugar the excess carbohydrate and it burns that first rather yeah. than breaking down fat. Um, so let's talk about the idea of using fat as a fuel source. And, and Seth, take us through what we're seeing over here. Why is it advantageous, um, you know, from a body composition standpoint, but also from an energy standpoint to, to utilize fat as a fuel source? Well, I'll just go back one room because, you know, when we're, when we're talking about how, how being, uh, you know, intaking these fast acting carbs blocks your ability to burn fat, what really happens is, is you spike your blood sugar and, and your bloodstream is, is flooded with glucose. And you know, when we're in a, when we're not eating, we may have only five grams of glucose in our bloodstream, and that's what maintains stable blood sugar. But when we take in all these fast-acting carbs, let's say we have a a bar with forty grams of sugar in it, or or, or a quick-acting energy bar or sports drink, we're putting in five to sometimes ten times the amount of sugar in our bloodstream, and that's a signal to the body that says, "Hey, I have all this sugar in my blood. Don't burn fat. Burn the sugar first. And you're really spending your workout burning the calories you just ate and, and not being able to really tap into that amazing energy source of fat, which is what the next slide was really about. And while we're on this point, um, Lisa raises a question uh, that, that's relevant to what we're talking about. And Lisa wanted to know, um, doesn't your body respond differently to sugar when you're exercising versus when your body's at rest? Um, what insight can you lend on that, Seth? So – you know, dur during during exercise, you know, what's what's critical is before the exercise, you know, to to keep your insulin levels low, which we'll discuss in a second. So the carbohydrates come in slowly, so you don't block your ability to burn fat. Uh, the, the the problem during during exercise is that you might you, you'll still spike your blood sugar from from consuming fast acting carbohydrates, and you know, although insulin might be a little lower during exercise, you know. You'll still not be able. To, you'll still not be able to tap into that significant source of, of fat for fuel. So when we look at uh, this this slide and, and we look at the difference between utilizing fat for fuel versus carbohydrates for fuel, uh, what are we seeing? Why is it advantageous to to be a fat burner, especially for endurance exercise? Is if what's what's going on is that basically. When you we have unlimited amounts of, of fat in our body, you could be you know 
180 pounds, 5% body fat, and still have over, you know, 10, 20,000 calories of stored fat, whereas you only have, you know, minimal amounts of liver glycogen and minimal amounts of muscle glycogen. So the, the main thing that's, that's going on is that, you know, fat's an incredible fuel source, and it actually has nine calories per gram, rather than only four calories per gram in, in your liver glycogen and your muscle glycogen. So the question is, is how do you allow your body to really access this use of fat for fuel? And if you can access this fat, what you're going to get is you're going to be able to break down those nine calories per gram into fatty acids that's then going to feed your muscle cell. And if your muscle cell is relying on more fatty acids, that means the less mu muscle glycogen it needs, so you're sparing your muscle glycogen. And also, if your body's relying on more fat for fuel, you're sparing your liver glycogen. And this is key because your liver glycogen is the only stored carbohydrate that actually feeds your brain. You start to lower your liver glycogen, that's what makes you feel depleted and low. And really, when you bonk during exercise, it's really a fuel crisis in the brain. That's when you're, you're really not you know, allowing your, your brain to get a steady flow of energy, and that's really where UCAN comes into play in providing that stable blood sugar. But I think the key is that the adaptation to endurance exercise, especially in general, is the ability to upregulate your mitochondrial enzymes to actually mobilize and burn more fat for fuel while sparing your, your muscle glycogen. That's how, you that's how you go from running only 10 miles to 15 miles, and that's how you become a better endurance athlete. And so you really want to be able to always access those unlimited fat calories in fat stores. For those of you uh, in here who know Seth, you know he's a very passionate guy, but I promise you he's not getting emotional about the subject right now. He's just a, a little bit under the weather. But, uh, but um, Seth, that was... Uh, that's a good. That's a good insight um, into into why you want to utilize fat. And and you know, um, Jen was talking about fuel formants and and Dina. A fuel formants is a it's a, a, a coaching and a and a, a training um, company and a, and a service. And Dina is one of the dietitians and another one of the uh, the dietitians and the founder of Bob Sibahar. He um, they championed this um, idea of metabolic efficiency, which is um, keeping your blood sugar stable and utilizing both carbohydrates and fat for fuel during exercise uh, or, or, or not, excuse me, not relying so much on carbohydrates, but really by keeping your blood sugar stable, really uh, using utilizing fat for fuel in exercise to a great extent. And, and Bob uh, said something to me about this that, that just always sticks in my head. It's, it's very fascinating. The a uh, 175 pound person, about 7% body fat, has enough stored carbohydrates in their body to fuel two to three hours of moderate exercise. That same person uh, has enough stored fat calories to fuel eight or nine Ironman triathlons. So, you know, the like like Seth said, being being good at uh, or or being an effective endurance athlete is really the ability to utilize fat as a fuel source. Um, it's, it's a powerful fuel source and it's an abundant fuel source. Uh, so Jen, once you made the switch from being a sugar burner to a fat burner uh, with UCAN, um, what were you, what were you really seeing? What did, from an energy perspective? Um, long paddles were so much easier. Um, big races were easier. Uh, like, Gosh, I had some some health struggles last year, just uh, just on the side due to a renovation work I'd been doing. I came down with pneumonia, um, but I came back much faster. And I had I think that that had a lot to do with my nutrition. Um, I know I did have a relapse. We didn't know it was fungal, but it it was fungal. And every time your immune system goes down, if a fungal infection isn't treated, it comes back. But uh, the, one of the races in between, um, after I recovered from pneumonia before I uh, relapsed with it, I ended up doing better than I ever had in any race, period, uh, which is fascinating because like a month prior, I was, you know, anemic with pneumonia. Um, and I actually came and won the race. <laughs> and it was about, a, if I remember right, it was about an hour and a half, two hour race. Um, and it's amazing how much longer and harder you can go without feeling it as much when you live a lifestyle that promotes stable blood sugar levels. Um, and you can a huge part of that. Um, before a race, if I have a you can, it 
just allows me to have a steady energy. Um, I don't feel like I need a kick and I don't feel like I'm going to suffer from a crash. I just go, which is really, really nice. And uh, I can go pretty long without eating or drinking <laughs> these days, which is absolutely awesome. And it's so funny because I can time it down to the minute when I will need to eat. <laughs> um, and it's about, it's a little over two hours. So that's pretty long, um, especially for the kind of heart rates that stand up paddle um, athletes run. Um, you know, I, I may do a two hour race and run at a heart rate that's between 170 and 180 beats per minute. And I'm 32 years old. So that's pretty high. And that's when I'm in top shape. Um, and then of course there's, you know, no stomach upset with you can, which is wonderful. Then going into like the, the really long ultra distance type stuff. Um, I actually, we tried to paddle around the island last year, which is 120 miles, and we didn't finish because I hit bad weather, but uh, I made it through the first two days, and I was able to hold a four mile per hour pace, which doesn't seem fast to a lot of you, but on a stand-up paddleboard going upwind, that, that's incredibly fast, um, without any stomach upset or any issue with food whatsoever, and it, to the point where it, I didn't, if I wanted to eat something, I could, but I, the thought of food, it, it was neutral, like I was going through a normal day. Um, and my energy levels remained completely steady. It was just like we were on a mission and it, you know, in spite of certain challenges that, you know, had to do with weather or conditions, or, you know, or anything else, all that aside, it was like clockwork. Um, it was pretty pretty incredible and I didn't have to stop to change anything very often because everything was in my camelback so um, we had a mixture and it included you can and some salt and some lemon juice and uh, and a little bit of sweetener and that was it um, sometimes I I do have a little bit just for something in my stomach I my dietitian doesn't promote this, but it seems to work for me, peanut M&Ms. But other than <laughs> <Yeah>. that, <laughs> um, you know, I can paddle for a day on UCAN, which is awesome because I don't have to stop and eat. Paddleboarding involves both hands, so any anything that you can do to stop fewer times really helps. And on an adventure paddle, it's not that big of a deal, but nowadays, um, you know, the Molokai to Oahu race is getting really, really competitive and minutes count. And so, um, so any advantage you can get from having really good stable energy levels, not getting sick while you're doing the crossing. And it's a situation where even the most seasoned athletes or um, I think a couple of special forces guys have done it too. And pretty much everybody gets seasick. <laughs> so, so to be able to push yourself that hard and not get sick at all um, is a pretty big deal. So I think we've, we've teased this uh, enough here where, where I realize there's some people in here that are familiar with you can, some people that aren't. So you've heard, you've heard some, you know, Jen's experiences with it, but let's, let's uh, dig in a little bit uh, about, you know, why Jen's feeling this blood <laughs> energy, why uh, that you can is an upsetting her stomach, um, and and talk about what really makes um, you can a very, very unique uh, unique product um, on, on the market. So, uh, Generation You Can was originally created for our founder son, who you see on the screen. His name is Jonah, and, and Jonah has a, a very rare disease called glycogen storage disease. Um, it basically affects the way that he stores carbohydrates in his in his liver. He can't convert these stored carbohydrates into blood sugar to give him energy. So back in the 70s and 80s, um, so this is a very rare disease, only affects about 3,000 kids in the country. Back in the 70s and 80s, um, these kids were dying at infancy. In the 90s, early 2000s, they found that by feeding these kids um, cornstarch that you find at the grocery store, because it had a slower burn than other carbohydrates, they were able to take a dose of cornstarch and it could give them the suitable energy for, you know, roughly two or, or not roughly or two hours, basically two hours. And, and they have to be fed 
uh, 10 to 12 times a day, every two hours on the dot, this cornstarch, um, this meant through the night, these families, um, uh, just like one of our co-founder, um, the Feldmans, they were setting an alarm every two hours at night to wake up and to give Jonah cornstarch. Um, because, you know, what would happen if, um, with, with typical carbohydrates with these kids is they would all get stored up into their liver. And, and Seth, you could speak to this a little bit better, actually. Uh, why don't I let you um, uh, talk about this? W what, what happens to kids like Jonah when they consume uh, normal carbohydrates for energy like, like you or I would? So they, they, they would simply overload their livers with the carbohydrate, and that could end up with fatty liver disease or, um, or overloading the liver. And, you know, when, when, we t when we're talking about that plain cornstarch, that would give just enough blood glucose to simply survive. So they had to be fed that 10 to 12 times a day, and uh, you know, Jonah's mother was waking up two or three times a night to to feed that cornstarch. With all that stress, they they looked for a better way, and now Jonah takes a dose of super starch before he goes to bed, and it lasts him eight hours. So he keeps his blood sugar stable and and, and can sleep through the night. And that's really how you can begin. And so when Seth referenced super starch, it's the first time uh, I think on this webinar we've said that word. Um, so for those of you who, who have not tried UCAN or aren't familiar with UCAN, that might be something new to you. So um, let's talk about what exactly the super starch is. And super starch is the carbohydrate in UCAN, and it really is the key to the product. So everything that that Jen's been sharing with us, um, it's it's all because um, you know she's she's getting all these these great uh, results from a body composition standpoint, from an energy perspective, um, you know, uh, because of her diet and because of this super starch carbohydrate. Uh, and, and not to discount the hard work you're putting in, of course, Jim, you know, you're probably training at a crazy clip as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice combination um, of the three. And, and so Super Starch um, was originally developed for Jonah and kids with glycogen storage disease. And this carbohydrate took eight years of research to develop. Um, all carbohydrates were evaluated because um, uh, they were looking for the carbohydrate that would maintain stable blood sugar for the longest period of times in these kids so they could at least sleep throughout the night. Um, so from, yeah, I mean, Varn, I think the big thing is that for, for eight years, the top carbohydrate researchers are in the country. We're looking at all different types of barleys and tapiocas and rices and wheats. And, and it really turns out it's, it's this specific type of, you know, non GMO ground up corn. And there's a, a heat and moisture process that slows the release of the carbohydrate out of the intestines and in the, into the bloodstream instead of, and dumping all dumping all into your bloodstream at once, and and that's really the uniqueness behind it. And and there's no enzymes and there's no chemicals because our first customers were two year old babies. So, like Seth mentioned, the super starch um, is is the carbohydrate, and it's it's derived from non GMO corn. It's it's um, it's natural the way that it's created, um, gluten free, non GMO, uh, like you see there. That's non genetically modified. For for those of you that are familiar with the term, and um, it's it's a it's a very fundamentally different way to think about fueling your body. Um, so the key to uh, super starch, you know, it started with Jonah, but but it soon spread to to first to start with some top endurance athletes, um, marathoners, triathletes. Um, really across all sports, tennis players, uh, pro football players, soccer players. We heard from pro, pro stand-up paddle surfer. I mean, I mean, you name it. Uh, and, and, and even just people exercising for general health and fitness um, to, to help manage their weight um, and just as a, a, to consume a healthier form of carbohydrate. And let's look at the, the really the key to what super starch is doing and why it's a fundamentally different way to fuel your body. So we talked early on uh, about about the fast acting carbohydrates that are common in sports nutrition products, and uh, you know, in your early sports nutrition products like your Gatorades, uh, those were just simple sugars, um, sucrose um, and and um, fructose and uh, dextrose. And the newer sports nutrition products started using a carbohydrate called maltodextrin. It's a, a long chain of glucose molecules, a complex carbohydrate that breaks down slower than your simple sugars. So. Maltodextrin was was sort of the the first real innovation in in carbohydrate to fuel your body and and that's what your your hammer products, accelerates, muscle milk, so they all use this maltodextrin carbohydrate. So when we uh you know had the idea that super starch keeps your blood sugar very stable, we wanted to see what effect it would have on athletes or on people that were exercising. So we didn't bother testing against simple sugars uh, because you know we knew that 
um, it would it would be more advantageous to fuel yourself than those. We wanted to see if it was a distinctly different from maltodextrin, which is what a lot of newer products were using. So this first graph, you know, you, you'll hear us say it time and time again, but the, the key to UCAN is the ability to stabilize blood sugar. And steady blood sugar can, in layman's terms, be translated into steady energy. Uh, that's what Jen was talking about feeling, a very steady feeling of energy um, when she feels with UCAN. And, and UCAN promotes that by stabilizing your blood sugar. So if you look at the red line in this graph, um, when you consume UCAN, your blood sugar is staying very stable depending on the person for between two and four hours. Um, meanwhile, with a, a typical maltodextrin, typical dose of maltodextrin you would take in, you get that initial spike in blood sugar. And then 30 to 30, 45 minutes later, when it starts to drop, that's when you feel like you want to refuel, you feel tired, you feel fatigue, um, you could feel hunger, dips in blood sugar often. Uh, also affect your, your cognitive focus. So there, there's a lot of things going on. So there, there's a lot of advantages to keeping your blood sugar stable from an energy perspective and just from, you know, the way you, so a lot of other things that you'll feel during exercise in terms of hunger or brain fatigue or brain fog and, and all of that. But this next graph that we're going to show you is Seth, uh, why don't you uh, talk us through this one? This next graph is, um, is very significant. And, and this is going to put a lot of more context around what Jen was talking about off the top. Yeah, so we, we did a clinical trial at the University of Oklahoma. They were elite cyclists hooked up to metabolic carts and taking blood draws every 15 minutes. And what we showed, which is, this was the most remarkable finding amongst all of our experts, was that we completely flatlined the hormone insulin. And insulin has two main functions in the body. The first function is it's a storage hormone. Um, and what it does is that it, it, it basically wants, when your blood sugar spikes, um, it, it, it's signaled to bring your blood sugar back down. The other thing is that it tells the body to store fat. So that's why when you take in those sugars, you spike your insulin, you turn off your ability uh, to burn fat and store it instead. And, and that, that's really key. I mean, the, the, the big thing is that your, your body is very sensitive to insulin. Insulin is one of the most sensitive hormones in the body. A little bit of insulin and you turn off the majority of your fat burn. And that's why it's this finding was so remarkable because we have, we're the first carbohydrate on the earth where 100% of it's absorbed as energy, yet we allow the body to continually burn fat. And, and, and that's so huge because you're going to get the, the energy uh, to your brain and muscles at the rate you need it by keeping your blood sugar steady because you can't really give you little bits of energy over time, actually matching the rate your brain and your muscles need fuel, but at the same time, you're able to break down and, and, and burn your own body fat throughout and post-exercise. You can even see our curves start to separate even more significantly post-exercise. So body composition is a, a major concern of yours or a major goal. You also want to take you can after your workout to get the effects of keeping your blood sugar stable while you continue the fat burning effect and continue to burn fat in the post-workout period. If you had uh, rice or pasta or breads, and you spike your blood sugar after the workout, your body's going to say, hey, I got all this sugar in my blood. All that fat that I burned during my workout is just going to recirculate back to my fat cells. So it's important to keep your blood sugar steady after the workout to not to take advantage of that post-workout um, period of fat burning. So Jen, you were talking about using UCAN for, uh, for recovery and, and, and how it's worked well for you. Um, what have you what have you been finding um, you know maybe either from uh, or, or yeah what, what have you been finding when you've used it for recovery how's it made you feel um, I definitely feel uh, an energy boost which uh, you know I think uh, when you're promoting stable blood sugar a lot of times your your carbs coming from either dairy or fruits and uh, and not necessarily complex sources um, because of that that insulin spike and so um being able to have a a carbohydrate coming from corn that gives you steady long energy really just helps helps the whole process i have more energy after my workouts i'm able to give more energy during my workouts um a lot of times like in this training cycle right now i'm trying to eat really really clean um especially since I did have that trouble last year being so, um, so sick. So, uh, you know, like I'm doing a three hour paddle this week, a five hour paddle next week, you know, so really long efforts with 
a lot of high intensity sessions mixed in in between. And so, you know, plain you can mixed with some, some plain whey and a little bit of chocolate and some almonds after a workout is just uh, an unbelievable combination. And uh, I use it also after my strength training sessions too. And my strength training sessions nowadays are like two to three hours long because when you're preparing for the Molokai channel, one of the things is you don't want to fall a whole lot and it takes quite a bit of leg strength, especially if the channel's big, to not fall over, you know, four to seven hours. So, so there's a whole lot of training going on and not a whole lot of time to recover from it. And I have really found that it kind of, it really fills in the gap in my nutrition. And also from a personal trainer's perspective, it really fits in that gap with my clients too. I work with a lot of weight loss clients and um, steady blood sugar is the way to go. It takes away that whole, um, you know, certain, especially wheat, I, you know, just looking from working with people and knowing myself, wheat's pretty darn addictive. And so it's nice to work with a, a starch that doesn't make your hormones go crazy. And also that myself and my clients don't um, have these uncontrollable cravings towards, but it's, it's really doing the job. And I really like that. Um, I don't, I don't like to have, you know, suggest for myself or anybody else to eat something that makes you want more. Um, I want to be in control of my food, not my food have control of me. So I, I just think all around it's really good. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, Seth, what, what uh, Jen just said about, um, you know, the, the idea of cravings. I mean, I mean, where does stable blood sugar come into play when you talk about um, wanting to, you know, cravings, because I, I think a lot of athletes who are used to consuming sugar may find that when you consume sugar, what you soon want is more sugar. Or when you consume fast acting carbohydrates, you just, it, it's sort of a vicious cycle. So where, where does stable blood sugar fit into that equation? Because, you know, when you, with you can, as with, you know, you're, you're getting that energy toward the brain at a very steady rate, you're feeding your brain glucose you know, at even and stable levels. It's not all, you know, spiking and, and, and coming down. And I think the key is that when, when your blood sugar drops even slightly, that's when you can kind of, that's when you get that, the, the body says, hey, it's time to eat again. And, you know, if, if your brain, your brain dictates everything. If your brain is getting fed at a constant rate and it's happy, um, you're not going to have those cravings. And I think that's key because when you keep your blood sugar steady and also when you allow your body to constantly release fatty acids, that, that, insul that low insulin response allows the, the body fat to constantly break down fatty acids. So you're not, you're not only burning sugars, you know, you're, you're, you're able to burn more fat. So you're sparing glucose and you're sparing that glucose for the brain. So you're not craving as much sugar because you're maintaining your energy levels, especially for the brain. And that's really key because your brain is what dictates your cravings. So we, um, you know, we, we've talked about you can for, for long um, endurance exercise and a quickly run through just what the products, uh, what what the two, two versions of the products are, but Chris also asks a, a good question about, you know, would you want to use UCAN for a workout less than an hour, and, and where where would the impact be? Which I think is a is an important question. Um, let's just take a quick look at what we we have on the screen here. So there's there's essentially there's um, two primary versions of the product. Now there's also what you don't see on here, what which Jen referenced was there, there's a um, there's a, a plain version of UCAN as well. It's just the super starch carbohydrate, nothing else, no flavoring, no sweeteners, uh, no electrolytes. Um, that's also available. You wouldn't want to mix that um, into a smoothie or mix it with some protein powder or, or something else that's uh, that's low sugar uh, that doesn't contain fast acting carbohydrates. But let's stick with what we have on the screen. We, we, we've got um, three fruit flavors, our sports drink mix, which is uh, in, if, if we're going to talk about just the packets right now, it's 30 grams of the super starch carbohydrate plus electrolytes. These are what you want to take 30 minutes prior to exercise. You shake it up with 8 to 12 ounces of cold water. It, it is a starch. It's not going to dissolve in water. You want to give it a good shake. I say cold water just for taste. I say 8 to 12 ounces of water for that same reason. You can mix it with as much water or as little water as you'd like. We found most people find 8 to 12 ounces to be the tastiest, but there's some folks that really like to dilute it, some folks that really like to make it concentrated and shoot it back as a gel. Um, 
The important thing is you want to think about UCAN not as a traditional sports drink that you sip on throughout the duration of exercise. UCAN is really that pre-workout snack. It's something that you have 30 minutes before, get it all in your system in a 5 to 10 minute span, and then allow the carbohydrate to slowly release into the body throughout exercise. Um, we found in general that if you're exercising for two hours or less, for a lot of people, one packet prior to exercise is all they need. Now, you can is not a substitution for your hydration. It's fuel. So you would still want to consume water um, while you're exercising. Uh, if, if you're a heavy sweater, you want to supplement with some additional sugar-free electrolytes. The UCAN does contain electrolytes, but because you don't need to keep fueling throughout your exercise um, you know, with a, with a sports drink that uh, you, you wouldn't be getting your electrolytes from a, a sugar-based sports drink. So you, you, you may want to supplement with electrolytes, but you may not have to. Um, so long story short, one packet for most people is good enough, is good for exercise that lasts two hours. Now, if you're exercising over two hours, we generally, and, and again, you're going to want to play around with the, the timing and the dosage. That's where the biggest learning curve is, figuring out how long exactly one packet or one serving lasts for you. But in general, exercise over two hours, most people are doing a packet every 90 minutes. And it's the same thing. They'll consume a packet in its entirety, uh, you know, 30 minutes before exercise within a five to 10 minute span. Then at the 90 minute, uh, you know, 90 minute mark, they'll um, consume another packet. And again, they won't be sipping on this over long duration. They'll consume the whole thing within a five to 10 minute span. One of these packets only has 120 calories of this sports drink mix. Probably pretty shocking for a lot of triathletes at first who are used to 250, 300 calories an hour. And and Seth, what would you say, you know, what's what's the primary reason people are, are you know, maintaining their power output uh, and maintaining their, their times and, and and all of that, but but able to consume significantly less calories? How, how does that work? You know, we, we always think about calories as what we consume, you know, but the truth is our, our best source of calories are really our, our internal fat calories. So you're making up those, those calories by breaking down you know um, your, your stored fat which is nine calories per gram you're you're, you're getting that energy at, at, out of your fat cells and out of your body so you're, you're making up that deficit uh, that way and that's all key to remember um, you know fats an incredible that, that really powerful fuel source and and you know people have noticed their power output goes up and, and one of the main reasons is that when you're burning so much sugar there's a lot of byproducts like lactate and people are noticing that as their muscle cells are using more fat for fuel, they're 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 producing less lactate. So and that's yeah, and that's really what's key is that that lactate is what causes that burning sensation in the legs and in the body. And the more fat for fuel you use, it means that there's less glucose you're using, and that means there's less glucose to turn to lactate. So the protein enhanced you can uh, the, the dark blue packets that you see um, that has the same in the packets the same 30 grams of the super starch carbohydrate same electrolyte content the sodium and potassium and uh, it also has 13 grams of added whey protein so the protein uh, you can is a pretty versatile product um, there's there's folks that like to exercise with a little bit of protein in their system uh, that'll take this uh, pre workout because it still has the same 30 grams of the carb to give you the energy. The protein's really in there to, to help silence that feeling of hunger. So if you don't like to eat before exercise um, or, you know, a lot of triathletes will have the protein packet at the start. It has 220 calories. They like to get those additional calories in them uh, before the start of the race. So you, you could certainly use the protein pre-workout. Uh, the protein also works great post-workout for recovery. It, re it really helps um, tide you over basically you know if, if you finish a hard workout and, and you get the you can right in you you it, it'll, it'll keep your blood sugar stable um it'll allow you to continue burning fat because it's not spiking your blood sugar like like we we detailed um previously and and we talked about how that affects fat burn uh and what's another important thing is when your blood sugar stable post exercise all the protein is being used by your muscles to to rebuild and repair so none of the protein is being converted uh, into into glucose or or sorry into uh, you know basically none of the protein is being uh, used to stabilize your blood sugar and and being used to give you energy. The protein can actually be used for its intended purpose. So protein you can is good pre or post workout. A lot of people like um, you know using it as well uh, in between meals as a as a as a snack in the middle of the day. Um, just uh, you know to keep their blood sugar stable so they're not snacking on a, on a you know maybe a 
a soda or a, or a, you know, an iced tea with a lot of sugar, um, that just something to keep your blood sugar stable throughout the day. Um, so Chris, we're yeah, going to, right. I think just to, just to interrupt, I think the, the main thing is when you're using, you can before an hour or two hour workout, it's really replacing, you know, that typical bowl of cereal, the banana, the, the bread with peanut butter, those, those, uh, the pre-workout energy bar, that's, you can is, is, is replacing those carbohydrates. So you actually can keep your blood sugar steady and, and allow your body to burn fat. Cause when you work backwards, anytime you use, you can versus any other carbohydrate before you work out, you'll freely burn fat rather than store it. And you'll keep your blood sugar very stable to the brain and to the muscles. So also, uh, good Jen, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I just go. wanted to add something to, I know you guys were talking about, um, how for long efforts, you know, um, athletes are using it every 90 minutes and, um, you mix it and chug it for people who are in sports where you don't always have time to mix and chug. I have done quite a bit of experimenting with mixing it with my hydration and it's worked really, really well. So just to add that, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't add it to your hydration and actually the plain, I've mixed it with hydration and you don't even taste it. And, uh, and if you can't just stop and chug, it's a really nice thing to be able to mix your food in with your water. And Jen, how, how long would you say that, that, you know, if you could estimate and when you mix it with your hydration, you know, what duration of time are you consuming, um, say like one packet over? Um, I was doing half to one packet per every liter of water and a liter of water will last me two hours. So, okay. and then, uh, and then with a little bit of extra electrolyte and potassium in there source. So a little lemon juice and some sea salt. Um, and it like for Molokai, that's what got me across the channel. And it was so nice because I could, I actually didn't have a helper this last year. Um, I just had the, the boat driver's dad, he was on the back. So there wasn't much communication about what my food was going to entail. All he had to do every two hours was pass me a new camel back. <laughs> pretty Which awesome. was fantastic. Pretty, so I pretty had, convenient. and I was able to mix it a couple days before and keep it on ice, and it kept just fine. It was really cool. That's awesome. Um, so we're pushing the hour mark. Uh, you know, we've got plenty of questions, so we're 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 going to still stay on. Um, I just did want to let um you folks know that for for joining us tonight. Um, if uh, if if you guys are interested in in uh, trying, you can if you haven't tried it before, or just uh, just getting some. Um, I just posted the code in the chat, but you can use the code you can learn at our online store and save 10% tonight. Um, it's generationyoucan.com uh, <coughs> store, and uh, the code is you can learn. So uh, that, that's active right now, and it'll be active through the night. Um, Elizabeth wanted to know if there was, uh, you know, just the, you see the difference between the packets and the, the tubs illustrated over here in terms of the serving size. And, and from a cost perspective, she was just asking if there's any dis, uh, difference in, the, uh, if, if one's more economical than the other, and the truth of the matter is, if if, if it's there's a very different, uh, a very um, tiny difference in the price. It's virtually the same price whether you're going with the packets or the tubs. So some people just like have found that they like the tubs um, because they uh, they you know they can customize their serving size easier than a packet. Um, but that there, if you've used them both, um, then you see the conversion chart in terms of the serving size. Um, we had a, a question from Amy and I actually wanted to bring Jean on because Amy asked a question and then Jean shared some feedback, uh, about Amy's question that sort of answers Amy's question. So I figure let's let Jean, uh, do it than Amy, but let me just, uh, read Amy's question aloud. Um, she says for, uh, an eight hour, um, for an eight hour event, um, you know, what feeding time do you recommend for you can, do you want to sip it off and throughout? or take large feedings every few hours. So, you know, Jen uh, gave us some perspective on how she's doing it for a really long event. She's actually sipping on Yukin and she's been finding that it's it's worked well for her. Um, I will say the most common way we get people using it is um, that, that, that they're gonna consume it all um, in a relatively short period of time, but we've had um, several other folks just like Jen tell us that they're doing it her way and, and, and been getting good results with it too. But um, 
to, to offer a, a bit of a different perspective on on how he uses it for events of those uh, that duration. Let's uh, let's see if we can get Gene on here. Gene, are you with us? Yes. Can you guys hear me? We sure can. Gene, long time. How you been? How are you doing? Good. I'm doing well. I hope uh, your buddy Seth is feeling better. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We're trying to get. We're trying to get him back in action. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Well, that's you. good. You shared some. Uh, well, you shared some great feedback in the chat. So uh, why don't you just go ahead and share it out loud? Okay. Uh, well, this past weekend I ran the Umstead uh, 100 mile endurance challenge in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and um, for the fueling strategy I used with the UCAN is uh, I added two scoops of the uh, the lemonade UCAN to about 10, maybe 12 ounces of water, uh, and that lasted me. Uh, about two and a half to three hours. Um, the course was eight, twelve and a half mile loops. So uh, we'd come back through an aid station at the the finish of every loop, and I would just uh, mix up the the UCAN and basically chug it and uh, head back out. And um, and Jen spoke to this earlier. The the nice thing I find about it in those in longer endurance races is. Uh, it just, the UCAN just basically takes the, the worry out of your fueling strategy. Um, you know, I know if I hit that shake every two and a half, three hours, I got a nice steady fuel source. Um, prior to using the UCAN, you know, I'd come into the aid station, you'd kind of grab this and that, and you know, a handful of chips or M&Ms or, or whatever, and, uh, you know, you'd feel good for a while, and then you'd, you'd just kind of peak and valley throughout the race, but... Um, now it's just you know my feelings become very efficient. I don't have to think about it. It's it's not a bother, and um, it's also in a race like that. It, it's a time saver because um, I'm in and out of the aid stations. Uh, normally, if you go in and you're kind of looking around for food, can't decide what you want, you're spending let's say five minutes every time you come through a, an aid station, like on a course like that where you're you're coming through eight times you could potentially be adding 40 minutes to your overall time, whereas I'm in and out, you know, I have my uh, fueling strategy, I, I chug the shake, and uh, I'm good to go. So it, it really worked out well for me on this race. Uh, now, now well, I want to po uh, pose this question to Gene, to you and to Jen as well. Um, and, and this was one that I, I see Gary's, uh, Gary's here with us, and, and Gary had emailed me this question uh, earlier tonight that he wanted to, us to address on, on this, uh, on the webcast. And, uh, Gary's doing the uh, the Silver Rush 50 run as part of the Re Leadville Race Series. Um, he's expecting to be out there for about 12 to 14 hours, and, and he wanted to know the um, the best types of foods that he should use to supplement fueling on on race day. Um, and you know because he wants to train with the similar food. So Gene, what do you, what do you do? Um, and then Jen, we'll pose the same question to you. What what do you do in terms of food um, along with you, Ken? What have you found that's worked? Um. Yeah. Usually using the UCAN, my, my craving for solid food is pretty much eliminated. Um, if I feel like a, a little hollowness in my belly uh, during the run or during training, I'll just, um, at the aid stations this past weekend, they had just some, some peanut butter and jelly. Um, so I had a wedge of that. But really, as far as additional food supplementation with the UCAN, it, it's usually pretty minimal. And that also helps as far as not having a lot going on. Um, in your stomach and, and having to worry about any GI issues or, or things like that. But if I, if I need to, to supplement with the UCAN just to kind of, it's not for additional fuel, it's just sometimes getting that little hollow feeling out of the stomach. Um, I'll usually just have a, a, a little wedge, not even a full sandwich of like uh, peanut butter and jelly, and, and that's usually uh, enough to get that hollowness out uh, of the stomach and, and keep moving on. And, and I'm sorry, you may have said this already, but were you were you using the uh, the protein you can um, during the race, or were you or what flavor were you using? No, I was using the lemonade. You're using just the, the, the straight without the protein. Okay, without the protein, and you still find yeah. even without the protein, you still find that you're not getting all that hungry. Uh, no, no, it's it makes a huge difference as far as not you know having to to eat or or take in a lot of solid food and. Uh, even what, what Seth had, had referenced, uh, you know, even using it afterwards because uh, I did take a shake when I was done with the 100-miler because uh, <laughs> I had to drive home myself, and that really helped me get back to the house in one piece. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, Jen, how about you? What are you doing uh, for food along with the UCAN? Yeah, it, uh, it kind of depends on the event. Um, if it's 
anything um, relatively short, meaning under five hours. I haven't really used anything. Um, I'll bring stuff along just in case because especially for any open ocean situation, you, you kind of plan for plan A, B, C, and then some. Just just kind of everything just in case because so much effort and planning has gone into that. You, you really don't want to mess up because you fail to think of something that's you know possible. But uh, I usually put a little variety pack of foods in my pack just in case, but I find that I don't really use them. Um, if anything, like a little ham and cheese sandwich quarter. Um, and I know I, I mentioned the chocolate M&Ms. Occasionally, I will put those in there, and, and sometimes I do use them. But it's like, again, like maybe three or four every three hours on a long, long haul. And that's like compared to what most people take in, that's next to nothing. Um, I like the, the little ham and cheese because it does work. I find that, you know, if I go for anything over eight hours, I start to like miss the fact that I ate lunch. Um, you know, just, I didn't have any meal. And so that ham and cheese kind of takes the place of, you know, where if I were at home doing normal activities, I would have eaten something solid. But um, other than that, I I don't really need much food on top of you can, and it's more of a just in case thing, as opposed to a I actually am am planning to use it. Um, pretty cool. So it's pretty you know relatively uh, similar uh, feedback from both you and Gene. Um, hey Gene, thanks thanks so much for sharing. Great great work um, again. Fantastic race. Congratulations and um and we know you're gonna keep rocking it throughout the summer. So look forward to. To hearing how things keep going. All right, thanks, guys. Feel yeah. better, Seth. Thanks, Jade. <laughs> hey, Seth. Um, so you know, uh, and and actually, you know, I, I want to. We, we've been talking a lot about endurance, and and we have uh, Elizabeth had a couple of questions that we're definitely going to address. But but um, you know, I just realized that that we 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 sort of got off topic of Chris's uh, initial question, which is, what's the benefit of using UCAN for shorter workouts? Um. Seth, you know, those hour or less workouts, we've talked a lot about endurance, but where does UCAN come into play for those workouts that are an hour or less? Well, the main thing is that you need to stabilize your blood sugar in some way. And so UCAN is going to give you that energy that's going to match the rate your brain and muscles need to fuel it for even those shorter workouts because you still need steady energy for the shorter workouts. And you still want to be able to have – be breaking down fat and, and, and burning that fat during those workouts to take also advantage of that post-workout period because during that workout, you're stimulating a lot of fat burn, but you still need to keep that effect continued into the post-workout period. Um, we have a lot of people use UCAN for 30-minute speed workouts, CrossFit workouts that are 30 minutes. Um, so I, I think, I mean, that's how I use it for strength training that's 30 minutes or so. So I think it's that's really key is just, it's easy on the stomach so it's because it's so tough to time a meal before you work out. And then it's going to give you that stability you need to get through the workout and match the rate the brain needs fuel. And then you're not going to feel ravenous afterward. You'll continue that stable blood sugar effect so you can go on with your day and not be a slave to, to, to the timing of your meals. I yeah, think I, Jen, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to speak to that a little bit too because I have an awful lot of workouts that are just an hour long and they're really, really intense. And, um, or even for a milder workout, it's a good carbohydrate source for my, usually I wake up and have a, a shake and, uh, you know, if I didn't have, you can, I would probably put a half a cup of berries or half a banana in there, but the, and, and you'd still in sort of a way be promoting stable blood sugar because you're combining it with protein, but at the same time, it still runs out and you're still getting a little bit of that that sugar spike from the fruit, whereas you can a much better carb because you don't have to worry about it doing that. And there's no other carb out there that's like that. And you can't, you don't want to go all the way off of carbs because you do need, you know, carbohydrates as an energy source. So it's just a much nicer way of having steady energy through any sort of workout, not just a long, super hard and, you know, endurance effort. 
for the shorter ones or even strength training, it's really good. Yeah. I think I think to add, add to Jen's point, I think before you can came along, a lot of people settled on a scoop of protein and, and half a banana before a workout to try to stabilize their blood sugar. But the thing is is that with you can every gram of this carbohydrate converts to blood sugar and, and it's it's absorbed as energy. And that's what's so key is that it's not passing through the through, as fiber through the colon that that, that some fruits will or and that's what's so key is you're getting all the energy at, at the rate you need it and you actually every gram of the carbohydrate you pay for you get as your blood sugar which is really cool I think with a lot of those uh, you know especially the high intensity workouts too you know just having something that's not going to be you know that 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 isn't a bar that's going to be sitting in your stomach um, you know with you can really feeling so light on your stomach uh, that's another big application of it for the shorter workouts is that that you know it, it's it's not going to be it's not going to make you feel heavy it's not going to make you feel uh, like you've got something bogging you down especially when you're doing those shorter intense efforts and and you know I think Gene talked about it um, he, he talked about it in a little different context but but you know he talked about uh, when he's done with the long effort using the UCAN for recovery to stabilize his blood sugar so he, he's not completely run down when he's driving home but but you know if, if you're to if it sort of work backwards and 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 think one packet of you can last you two hours so okay you have it and then you go work out hard for say 45 minutes then you want to drive home take a shower cook yourself a nice meal you know suddenly it's two two and a half hours later and you still have steady energy and you're not going into that meal with with low blood sugar you're not completely ravenous you're not you know making poor nutrition choices something quick and convenient because you have that that low blood sugar um so you know, just the idea of of you can keeping your blood sugar stable um, is is so beneficial in, in just in around the full context of your workout, both during your workout for energy and the way it makes you feel post workout. Um, so let's see, we got uh, we got uh, several questions still here, and I want to make sure we get to all of them. So let's um let's take a, a stab at Garrett's question here, and then uh, Elizabeth, Amy. Uh, Mona, I see all you guys and, uh, and Phil as well. And I promise we're going to get to, uh, to everything here. So, um, Garrett wants to know how you'd recommend taking UCAN for high school track athletes. Um, he's had success with UCAN for the 1600 meter, the 3200 meter. And, um, so I think we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the, the idea of using it for shorter workouts, uh, but you know, for, for the track athletes, um, it's, uh, we have a, a 1500 meter runner. Uh, uh, she was uh, finished fourth at the Olympic trials last summer named Gabriel Anderson. And, and something that she said in terms of using it for her workouts is that it just took the worry out of her nutrition. You know, even if she was doing a, a, a series of sprints or, or, or different tempo runs or, or, or different types of uh, efforts in a 45 minute span, just having you can her system she knew that she was going to be able to push herself at the beginning and at the very end of the workout. She didn't have to worry about refueling. She didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, sort of the guesswork in her nutrition. You know, how am I going to feel today? How am I going to feel tomorrow? Uh, you know, the next time I do this workout. So um, I think in terms of Garrett, taking the guesswork out of it for the type of uh, efforts that you've been doing, I think um, that's a big part of it. But but Seth, you know, in general for somebody in, in Garrett's situation uh, and, and a high school athlete, what, what would you recommend? So I think before, you know, usually track practices are anywhere from an hour and a half, usually an hour and a half, I'm guessing, to two hours, and when you include the warm-up. So I have a packet or, you know, or two scoops of, if you're using the tub 30 minutes before the workout, um, and that should be good for the workout, you know. Um, I think the main thing is during during his meets, I think you should think about is having you can steady releasing through your body because, you know, when, in a track meet, you're never really sure the exact timing of your event, so you might want to try to have have a a dose of you can every hour and a half to two hours or so, just to keep it your blood sugar steady throughout your event, and not have to worry about something sitting heavy in the stomach. So, uh, Garrett, excuse me. Hopefully that um, that answered some of your questions. Um, and glad to hear you've been having success with it. But if there's anything else uh, that you wanted a little bit more specific, I'm actually also going to. Uh, put in um, a, a, an email address into the chat right now, which is a, a way to reach Seth if, if you want to drill down some specific usage. It's UCANRD at UCANCO.com. But uh, Garrett, if, you, if there's anything that we didn't touch on, feel free to ask another question in the chat or, or you could feel free to email Seth as well. Um, Elizabeth uh, had a few questions. I think it might, it, 
several things that that will probably be of interest to a lot of people in here. Let's uh, see if we can bring Elizabeth on to chat with us. Elizabeth, are you there with us? I am here. Hey, Elizabeth, how are you doing? Go ahead. Um, I'm good. What are you Great. Um, my issue has been a lot of lower GI distress when trying to um, get some nutrition excuse me, nutrition and fuel in my system for longer events. And I got to the point where I just gave up on taking anything in except water. And um, sometimes I'm out there training a while and I get very tempted to want to take a gel or a goo or something. And I still do sometimes, but I have to actually know my course that I'm running or, or biking to know where are the places that I'm going to be running into the woods to go to the bathroom. So I want to find a way to make this work for me. I really want to give it a shot. I want to give, you know, 200% into um, finding the proper way to fuel with you can. And I've tried it and I've been using it mostly on the bike because I'm still a little leery about trying anything on my runs. But not that my runs don't have problems anyway, but um, on the bike it seems to be good. I can mix it up, and it's been really cold here in Pennsylvania until like two days ago, so I can put it on my bike. But when I'm doing my half Ironman in June in Hawaii, I think what I have to do for that event is drop off my run bag and my bike stuff at two separate transition areas, and I did want to you know, get in a system and train from now until the next seven weeks with you can. And um, how can I make, I know we, through emails, we talked before about how I can make some gels up for the run. Yeah, Elizabeth, we, we've emailed, right? You, you sound have. too familiar. Yes, we have. And you gave me great suggestions. Oh, and you hear the thunder and lightning coming now here. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. Yeah, we just heard that thunder. Yep. That storm's coming through. But um, I really think like when I try something, I have to give it 100% or 200%. And I want to try 200% with you can before I give up and say, oh, this isn't helping my GI system at all. But um, so how can I keep this stuff? Because it needs to be maintained cold, I assume, once you mix it. And... Um, along the course, at, and I did, and I know I can talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, but, um, so I don't need to, I don't know if this pertains to anybody else listening, but um, since I need to also take in extra sodium and electrolytes, how do people normally get that into their, when they're out on a long course where they might be out there eight hours or ten hours? So, all right, I'll, I'll just answer it initially, but I think the first thing is for your running, Elizabeth, just try and pack it out before an, an hour run. You know, it doesn't have to be right after the bike. Just to see how you can work during your running. Have a, a pack it thirty minutes before an, an hour or so run. Just and just try it out that way in the beginning. A regular, you mean a regular packet like the lemonade or the pomegranate, something not with the protein, just a regular packet. Yeah, yeah. Just try it out thirty minutes prior to a workout. Okay. And should I mix that with just regular water? Because sometimes I mix the protein ones with almond milk. Oh, so, so yeah. So, you know, if if you tolerate the protein well before exercise, yeah. you're, you're fine to have that before. Um, I just assume that I'm, during your Ironman, you're probably not going to have the protein, you know, after the bike. That's why I was discuss having the this, the lemonade or pomegranate before. Okay. So, uh, in fact, tomorrow I need to do a run in the morning before work, and it's an hour run. So what I'll do is I'll mix up a regular packet with water because on the bike I can tolerate, I think it's that jumping, jarring thing with running. On the bike I'm really good with taking the protein that I mix with almond milk and even if I'm on my bike trainer in the morning I'll try to sip on that. I can't take too much of it at one time because I think maybe it's in my head but I'm worried I'm going to end up having GI problems. Yeah, so, so I think... I, Elizabeth, I just think also you can always use less water. You know, before, for example, before a um, a morning run, people sometimes use our plain you can with four ounces of unsweetened almond milk and some cinnamon, and they make it as a shot, and they have it thirty minutes, or sometimes even twenty to thirty minutes before their their run, and and that's what they do for their 
That's what a lot of morning no, runners I, are doing. Okay, say that again. You said they're mixing cinnamon with... So a packet of plain you can or, or, or a scoop of plain you can, either one. Okay. With, with, four to, with four to six ounces of unsweetened almond milk, some okay. cinnamon, and you make it into a shot. And then you just put it in one of those little tiny bottles. Right, and you know, yeah, you just you just shake it up and and have it as a shot thirty minutes, you know, twenty or thirty minutes before your workout. I mean, oh, before you even go out in the morning for your workout, and then that should give me enough energy, and that might be a good test for me too, actually, to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, and if you don't have the plain, you can always do that same principle with the pomegranate blueberry or the lemonade. Just have it with six to, six to eight ounces of cold water. Shake it okay. up and have that thirty minutes prior to your your run. So I'll try. I'm going to try that tomorrow morning, because I've been so, like, I have seven weeks to go. So I've been so trying to find some way that I can get nutrition in me, because I know I put in my email to you how I don't take anything because it's not good. And then I finish an event and I'm just completely spent because I've taken nothing except water and sometimes I take a little salt. Right. And, and speaking to your question on on electrolytes, you can always use salt sticks. I mean, we just had a a triathlete Natasha Vandermeer Van on our blog, which Varn can post in the uh, the chat. He might even be able to post that link. But you know, she describes how she uses it exactly and how she takes salt sticks on the side and electrolytes on the side because you okay. can't really fuel source not your hydration. Okay, and that's what I have to remember. And I think I saw something that was sent to me from you, Ken, about her and the salt sticks. And this is a silly question, but where do you get salt sticks? Where does a, or just a regular person go get salt sticks? Um, you know, I think Varen actually posted a link to it. We should get paid by those companies, but, you know. Um, oh, I have to go back up there and look. Yeah, I think you can find, uh, find, uh, find it on, on the blog link. Okay. Okay. And I'll actually post the blog link uh, in the chat right now. And if you see, if you look in uh, Natasha's post, um, she will. Uh, there's there's a point where she references what exact she's using salt sticks, and we've just linked. Okay. Yeah, we just linked to their website. That's excellent. So you'll, be able to, That's excellent. you'll be able to catch okay. it there. Um, but Elizabeth, good luck. And 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 you know, you're talking. I mean, you're talking about uh, keeping it cold. And Amy actually had a similar question about. Um, how long you can uh, can it can it last unrefri unrefrigerated? Uh, you know, in general, we say um, once you mix it, uh, you should consume it within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, there was a college mm -hmm. basketball coach that was mixing it up on Monday for the entire week. Um, now, of course, he was refrigerating it, but he was mixing it up on Monday um, for the entire week, and the players were having it on Friday and and reported no problems. But but you know, in general, we okay. tell people once you mix it. 24 to 48 hours. Now, in terms of uh, it, it being hot, um, and you were talking about your situation in Hawaii. Uh, I mean, Jen, what do you what do you uh, what do you find when you're doing those long efforts? Um, does does do you have trouble keeping the UCAN cold? Uh, how does it interact with uh, your stomach when it's when it's not uh, you know ice cold and it gets a little bit warmer in the sun? Yeah, um, I. I'm sure it would be fine. A lot of times I keep it cold more because I'm mixing it with lemon juice too. Um, and oh. with, uh, with long events, a lot of times we have boats with us. So that's the nice thing is they have ice chests and okay. you tell them, you know, you ask them what you, you know, want to keep cold and not. That makes sense. Um, but, uh, but as far as, you know, competitions where I can't refrigerate it you know if I bring it with me it's not a big deal I just chug it it doesn't I've never had stomach upset problems with it but also you know um, working with a registered dietitian who's an expert in this area really does help because then by the time you're at the event everything's already dialed in so if like all of those questions are are things that definitely you know working with an RD who specializes in metabolic efficiency and sports nutrition really does help because, you know, details do matter and, and it just kind of takes all the questions out of it. But as far as keeping it warm, I've never had any problems and I, I've used it under okay. circumstances that, uh, that, you know, people with the toughest stomachs get, you know, are throwing up over the side of boats and mm -hmm. I haven't had any issues. So. And, and Jen, just, to, I mean, um, you know, Elizabeth, just to discuss the uh, you know practicality of it, you can always take a fuel belt bottle, a ten ounce bottle, and 
put two packets in there and and have and and, and make that as your oh, serving. Add the water along the way. Well, you you could do that, or you could always just add it before. It all depends on on that's personal preference. Okay, okay. I didn't think of that, and just carry the fuel belt and just get used to that. I should start wearing that again, maybe. Um, yeah. And then it sounds like every ninety minutes or so, I should take another packet. Is that right? Yeah, and you ultimately experiment during your your training. So, okay. you know, using you can before those hour runs in the morning will really give you an idea of how you feel and. Okay. And you use it for your shorter workouts during the week, and then use it for your, at at ninety minute intervals during your longer workouts on the weekend. Okay, that sounds great. I'm going to give that a shot, and then I can always contact you if something's not working right or. If and I'm just give feedback. We love hearing feedback. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Elizabeth. So much. I I appreciate your time. Yeah. Good Thanks, luck. Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Jen, Amy had a question for you. She had a couple questions, but uh, but let's start with the one for you. She wanted to know um, what you use to make your breakfast smoothies with uh, if you don't use any fruit. Um, I will generally – so uh, I like the packet of plain you can. And then, um, and then I'll use unflavored whey and a little scoop of unsweetened organic chocolate. And then I usually like to put um, like hemp seed or chia seed in there for a little extra um, nutrition. But uh, yeah, and then um, if I do, sometimes I do combine it with a tiny bit of fruit just since it's the morning. And um, those smoothies, I usually do two cups of spinach or, and a half a cup of berries, a plain you can, and, uh, and a scoop of plain whey with some stevia. So, and that's, that's eating really, really clean. If, uh, if it's a time of year where I'm mostly for focusing on shorter events, then, um, then I will use a, a flavored whey product, which the you can protein packets are awesome for that. Um, cause they have everything in there. And, uh, and then I just put the, you know, like the vanilla protein packet in and, uh, and my hemp seed and whatever else that I'm going to mix with it. I do like putting vegetables in my smoothies because uh, uh, vegetables aren't my favorite thing in the whole world. So uh, Jen, being able to add. Jen, so do we actually. I, I convinced Varen to start putting spinach in his smoothies too. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, I, I, I posted Jen's smoothie um, in, the, in the chat just now, but I'm posting a uh, – um, another one, and it's, it's it's a pretty simple one, but but sets sets right. You know, I used to uh, for breakfast be just the chocolate you can, eight to twelve ounces of almond milk and a table a tablespoon of uh, natural peanut butter. But uh, Seth was uh, telling me that he's been putting a lot of spinach in his smoothies, so I started adding a cup of spinach to that, and and truthfully, it just makes it creamier, and you can't taste it at, uh, at all. You know, it's a great way, like you said, to hide a serving of vegetables into your uh, into your smoothie. So that uh. That works pretty well, um, and and yeah, this, the adding adding the spinach, adding the greens works really well. Um, you know, Seth talked. Uh, you know, another very simple smoothie set that I know that that you you've been having a lot is just the plain you can with a, a scoop of a flavored way of protein powder. It could be whey, it could be whatever protein powder um, you like, and then um, and and just doing it like that and mixing it with either almond milk or water. Right, that works pretty well, and it's pretty simple. Yeah, and I think. I think the, the 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 breakfast shake Jen is talking about, or the adding the spinach to it, those are great even on non-workout days. You know, you you have this smoothie for breakfast; they can last you, you know, anywhere from four to five hours. And you know, you're spending the morning with stable blood sugar to the brain, and you enter lunch with this feeling of I could eat, but I don't have to. So you're really, you know, you know, controlling your blood sugar throughout the entire day and allowing your body to be in a fat-burning mode, which is really key to just maintaining energy. Uh, Amy had two more, and then I definitely want to get to Phil's uh, Phil's question too. Phil had a question about uh, UCAN and low carb diets. Um, so, uh, but but Amy's question, this is one I think that apply to a lot of folks. Um, uh, she wanted to know if you consume more than one serving prior to a long effort, will the energy last longer? So, Amy, the you know the simple answer to that is that it's it's really a it's really a trial. So, what, what, you know what you want to do is uh, in your training. See how long one packet lasts you. You know, say it, let's just start, say it could be ninety minutes for starters, and then, then you'd want to take two packets before you run and uh, and see how long two packets last you. And and what we found in general is that if one packet lasts you ninety minutes, two packets will definitely last you longer. But it doesn't necessarily 
double the time, you know, which is why I'm saying it's very important to try it out in your training because you can't assume if one lasts 90 minutes, taking two before is going to last you three hours. It doesn't really work that way. You know, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of different for each person. Um, but, but two will definitely loading with two before will definitely last you, um, longer than having one before. And, you know, we have a lot of, uh, people who are doing, uh, you know, three hour marathons, taking two packets of you can before taking another half to a full packet around mile 17 or 18. And that's all the the calories they're consuming. So, you know, you're talking about if you're using the non-protein and talking about two and a half to three packets, you're really talking about, uh, you know, 300 to 350 calories to, to do a three hour marathon. So uh, two, two packets uh, prior will, will, will certainly last you longer or, or two servings prior could will certainly last you longer. And uh, it just, you'll want to play around with it, see how much longer it'll last you and then figure out, you know, if it's worthwhile to take to, to load with two or if, or if you'd just be happy, just, um, you know, incrementally taking one every so often. And then Seth, Amy asked, actually also asked about uh, supplementing with the caffeine source during long efforts. Um, what would you say to that? How does caffeine interact with you, Kim? I, I, it could possibly have a synergistic effect because, you know, ca- caffeine does help mobilize fatty acids. If you can't allow your, you can't allow your body to be in a fat burning mode. Um, and promote fat burning, so I think it, they could work. They, they work well together, and we've had people respond very well to caffeine, and you can, especially for endurance sports. If you're using caffeine along with an Amy, you know, of course, just make sure it's not a, it's not something like a, like a carb caffeine mix, like a gel with caffeine or something that would spike your blood sugar. You know, so make sure it's uh, some source of caffeine uh, on its own, and you're not, you're not consuming your caffeine um, along with uh, fast acting carbohydrate. So. Um, Hopefully those answered your questions. Uh, Seth, uh, th- this one is uh, this this one is certainly for you. Uh, this comes from Phil, and Phil had an initial question that he emailed me uh, earlier today, and then uh, he sort of had a follow up. But he wanted to know um, if you're not on a low carb diet, um, you know what I, I you don't you may not be able to quantify this exactly, but you know what percentage of the value of super starch do you get if you're not on a low carb diet, and is it a good product to help transition? to a low carb diet. So I guess basically his first question is, you know, is this still work for people who aren't, uh, on a low carb diet? Yeah. I mean this, we have people doing all different t- types of eating plans, high carb, low carb, just, you know, general, ge- general diets. I mean, there are NBA players using you and they have, t- they have some of the worst diets in the world and they'll take a packet before their practice. That could be three hours and, 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 and they have steady energy and respond very well. They take it a, a packet before, before games too. I mean, you know, we're in 75 colleges, and, and college players are also not exactly known for their, their, their good diets. So um, I, I think the answer is that, you know, you're, you're going to get two benefits that you can is that you're going to be able to stabilize your blood sugar and also freely burn fat. And the more you use you can, even regardless of your diet, the better effect you start to notice. You know, obviously, if you, if you have a diet lowering sugar, you're, you're likely to get some better benefits. But that said, people that, you know, don't have great diets that are still using you can um, because they're they're they're, they're active are, are also getting great benefits so um you know that's for you to kind of play around with um, I can I go can ahead, speak Jen. to this this a little bit too um, the last year I actually I didn't know it but I had a pneumonia relapse right before Molokai and uh, Molokai is a 32 mile race through open ocean channel it's not a gentle race um, it's gnarly. And uh, I, we decided to put carbs back in, I'd say about three weeks prior. Um, I mean, we're, I always have carbs, but, but more carbs than one would do if they were following a metabolically efficient lifestyle. And, uh, and I crossed the channel in seven hours on UCAN with full-blown fungal pneumonia, <laughs> which I wouldn't suggest doing that, but it does speak to the product that um, even if you're not following a, you know, a diet where you're, you're managing um, your blood sugars and all of that, it still really, really works. That's, uh, that's, that's quite the, quite the experience. I'm, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you, you felt, you felt and pretty indescribable after that, that crossing that channel with with fungal pneumonia. I can't, I can't even imagine. Um, but but Martin, Martin, to speak to his next question, I think you can does help you transition to a diet that promotes stable blood sugar and a lower carbohydrate diet because when you're transitioning from 
you know, a high sugar intakes to lower sugar intakes, you're going to experience withdrawing. Having you can in between meals or as that breakfast shake that Jen was talking about really helps set the stage to help transition your diet to a, a better diet. And, you know, I think, too, um, some of this uh, may apply with people who are transitioning into a, a low-carb diet. And, and you know, we, we've gotten a lot of, uh, of this type of examples from, from people who are uh, reducing their calories when they're trying to lose weight. Uh, a lot of people, when either when they're trans, transitioning to low carb or when they're they're reducing their their caloric intake um, to try to to drop weight, they struggle with energy for their workouts. You know, they uh, because they're either a lot of times even with weight loss, cutting calories, they're they're really reducing carbohydrates and um, just don't, don't have the energy to work out hard. And uh, with you can, they're finding that uh, that they really are able to transition to a lower carb or, or eat less and still have the energy um, to get through their workouts because of how slowly and steadily it releases and, and the way it stabilizes your blood sugar and maintains your energy. So I think it's, it's, it's really uh, does help um, that transition into a low carb diet from an energy perspective and, and, you know, maybe also um, for in terms of reducing cravings. Um, we uh, Phil had one more follow up question, and, and thank you guys for all, all of you who are still here with us. We're pushing uh, an hour and a half. Jen, thank you so much uh, to you for sticking uh, along with us for this long. Um, you know, I guess we, we as long as people, we, we, we only got a couple more questions uh, to get through, but uh, but I'm I'm very thankful to all of you. And uh, just for those of you who didn't hear it the first time, uh, the code you can learn uh, is active tonight for ten percent off um, at our online store. You just need to enter you can learn. Um, at, at checkout of our online store, and that is uh, posted in the chat. But Seth, uh, fill out a, uh, another um, follow-up to that, which was um, Dr. Jeff Volick. Uh, he's a, a carbohydrate researcher um, and, and also a big advocate of low-carb diets. Um, and, and in fact, super starch is the the only carbohydrate that that he um, that he he likes, I guess you can say, because. Of, of the way it keeps your blood sugar stable and it doesn't cause the insulin response. But um, Phil says that uh, Dr. Volick talks about reduced ventilatory drive on a low carb diet. Um, do you ex and he wants to know, do you experience a lower heart rate on low carb? Um, and if that's something you can quantify. So it's, it's interesting is that, you know, bec because, you know, first, first off, when you spike your blood sugar, it does tend for your heart rate to increase, but you're also, you're reducing the amount of, of carbon dioxide that that you're releasing. So with, with you know, and that's that's not a low carb diet, but what's interesting is that with you can, we also have people say that their heart rate is lower. Um we I get reports all the time from you know, we're in lifetime fitness where they measure heart rate and even customers email me that their heart rate was seven beats per minute lower on, on a run. So um, I think the key is that when you're keeping your body calmer because you're not you're avoiding those highs and lows in sugars, um, but you know you 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 do experience a, a decrease in, in ventil ventilatory drive because you're also putting less stress from the sugars in your body. So uh, Phil, I hope that uh, answered your questions. And uh, you know you've got my email. Um, we posted Seth's email in the chat. So if there's anything further you'd like to know on that, uh, we'd we'd be happy to chat with you. Um, we had one final question from Mona, and then if there's nothing else, uh, we will wrap this up. Uh, Mona wanted to know what the difference between UCAN and Vitargo is. And, and for those of you who don't know, Vitargo is another, um, it's another uh, nutrition product. Uh, they, they also have uh, promote a, a super carb, um, just like we call ours super starch. And um, it's, uh, I guess, um, Mona, let's, there, there truly is only one similarity between UCAN and Vitargo, and, and that is that they both have a very high molecular weight. And um, what that means is that, that large molecules pass through your stomach rapidly and they don't cause uh, GI distress. So with the simple sugars, they're, they're a bunch of they're small molecules. They sit in your stomach and they pull water in. And, and, and they, that's what causes a lot of the, the GI issues that you know, Jen was talking about earlier with the goos and that a lot of athletes experience from simple sugars. So, so really with UCAN and Vitargo, that's the only similarity is that they're both large molecules. But beyond that, they're actually polar opposites. If you if you read uh, the research from Vitargo, they um, tout uh, rapid replenishment of glycogen, basically a, a very, very fast rush of energy 
They also tout a very high insulin spike. Um, and, and Seth, you know, in I guess Vitargo is a product that's being used by a lot of bodybuilders. And, and why, you know, in, in terms of, of insulin response and, and, and Vitargo uh, saying that they have a very high insulin reaction, which is really the exact opposite of what UCAN's promoting, you know, uh, can you maybe just touch on what the old school um, thought about an insulin re- response was and why that would be promoted? Yeah, so to take a step a step back, you know, Vitargo is, 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 is fractionated barley starch. And what that is is it's already broken down. So when it enters your intestines, it spikes your blood sugar almost immediately. And, you know, the main reason why people would want, want wanted that in bodybuilding because they want they, – the old school thought was that you wanted to spike your insulin to help with muscle gain. But the truth is that in the past five or ten years, we've – it's been shown that it's really what – protein is necessary for recovery. And – you just really want, and you don't need excessively high blood sugar levels uh, to drive recovery or glycogen replenishment. So, uh, Mona, that uh, hopefully answered that for you. Um, so, you know, that quite actually, uh, quite quite different. Um, and and actually, if you look on um, both of our websites, you'll see that the claims and the research are actually um, uh, really talking about two opposite things. So, it's I, I think it's something that. Um, you know, for, for the steady energy um, and then the ability to, to utilize a lot of fat for fuel like like you do with Ethan with Super Starch, um, that's not necessarily something you would use Vitargo for. Uh, Jen, uh, great to have you on with us today. Looking forward to a, a big, uh, big upcoming few months for you. Um, before we sign off, uh, you know, let everyone know what's 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 going on next for you. What are you what are you gearing up for and what's uh, what's coming up? Um, well, I'm looking forward to the, the summer races here. Um, summer's a big time for downwind racing. Um, there's the Triple Crown in Maui coming up, which is three open ocean style downwind races. And then uh, after that, there's another race on Maui. And then Molokai's the following weekend. So it's, uh, it's a lot of long distance downwind bump riding, which bumps are open ocean swells and you get to surf them. So you're essentially surfing from one place to another, which is really, really a lot of fun. And also um, something that involves a lot of technique training as well as a a really high level of um, fitness. So so I'm training really hard for that. And then after that, it'll be uh, more flat water and getting ready for, we have a race called Battle of the Paddle, which is in California. And it's a, a huge race every year um, that pretty much, uh, if you can go to it, that's the one you go to. And uh, it's through surf and it gets pretty crazy. Uh, but definitely looking forward to all of that and really training training hard and doing what we do. And then also a lot of surf lessons for the summer, which is exciting and work and working with my clients for personal training. So lots of good stuff. Awesome. And uh, for anyone who's interested in uh, reading more about Jen, um, you can um, check out this post on our blog that Jen wrote. It uh, talks a lot about her background in the sport, uh, tells us a little bit more about the sport. And also, uh, you heard uh, a lot of it today, but she also goes uh, into her detailed uh, use of UCAN and, and how she was turned on to the product. And, and to that note, um, you know, we got to uh, see Dina, uh, Dina Griffin, who, who was referenced uh, several times by Jen and, and just... Uh, Got to thank Dina for for introducing us to Jen, for turning her on to to UCAN, and um, and you, you know for for learn more about Dina, if you uh, just go to uh, fuelformance.com, uh, that's the name of the of the service that um that or the coaching service that that Jen's using, and and they'll do a whole lot of great things uh, with you to to clean up your diet, to 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 get you to be really metabolically efficient, and um you know get a lot of the great results that that Jen's gotten, you know to to really uh get you to use more fat for fuel and just, just overall be a, be a healthier and, uh, and a more efficient athlete. So it's certainly worth checking out. And, um, Dean has a wealth of knowledge and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a great, great company. So, um, on that note, um, Seth, anything, uh, anything you'd like to share before we sign off for the night? I just think the main thing is for any of those new users who might've been on the, the webinar, just to use you can before an, an hour to two hour workout and then, Use it a few times that way before you use it for a, you know, a, a six to eight hour um, training day. So use it for those shorter workouts to get used to it and experiment before you use it for something longer. That's just some good practical advice. 
And really, yeah, best way best way to use it uh, if you're we're talking about the packets, eight to twelve ounces of cold water, shake it up really well, treat it as a pre workout snack, and have it thirty minutes before exercise. Um, if you're trying it out for one of the first few times, you're really going to feel the biggest effect uh, having it pre workout. Um, you know, over the long haul, if you're using it for recovery, um, if you're using it in the course of your workouts, um, you'll you'll certainly see a, a change in your body composition. But but from a pure energy perspective. Use it 30 minutes before a workout, and and you know we we it's it's really that you can feeling. It's gonna uh, you're gonna love the way you feel during exercise, and you're you're gonna be able to m- most importantly make it through your workout and and be able to push yourself um, from the beginning to the end. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining us tonight. Um, stay tuned to our social media pages. There'll, there'll be uh, several more of these, and um, and Jen, thanks for being our inaugural guest. Uh, we hope to have a lot more exciting guests, but uh, it's gonna be going to be tough to live up to you. You were awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, I'm so Thank flattered. You, Jen. Thank you so much, everyone. And, and aloha from Hawaii. And if you guys come visit, look me up. <laughs> <laughs> we sure will. I'm going to take you up on that offer. Good night, oh, everybody. <laughs> nice. Good night. Good night.